Hey you and welcome, my name is Mike, and in this old video we're going to look at the case of Darley Routier. Darley Routier. Damn it. This old one takes us to the distant year of 1996 in Roulette, Texas. Don't mess with it. The Routier family really loved the D. The letter D, big D, being in Dallas County and the family being comprised of Mother Darley, Father Darren, and three children. Six-year-old Devin, five-year-old Damon, and eight-month-old Drake. Lots of Ds in this one, I will try not to mess it up. Now, it's been said what's been laid against old Darley is circumstantial, and this uh, story has a lot of similarities to one we talked about not too long ago, Dandy Melgar. It's actually very similar to that case, so let's get into it. Darley was born in 1970 in Pennsylvania. After her parents' divorce, her mother, stepfather, and herself moved to Lubbock, Texas. When she was 15, she met future husband Darren Routier, marrying in 1988. Darren was quite a successful fella. He had a small company that tested electronic components. This led to the newlyweds purchasing a house in Rolette, a affluent suburb of Dallas. In 1982, Darren bought a Jag. The cat, if you can believe it. Nah, that'd be awesome though. Uh, he also bought like a 30-foot cabin cruiser. In 1992, Darley uh, underwent breast augmentation surgery. <laughs> nice. And you know, uh, they would often buy like lots of flashy jewelry, living the high life. Their first son, Devin, was born in 1989, followed by Damon in 1991 and Drake in 1995. They seemed to be a lovely, well-to-do couple, though um, people thought that maybe they were, you know, Spending a little too much, maybe living beyond their means. Maybe you should uh, tighten the old purse strings there, buddies. Especially when the successful business Darren ran became less so. In fact, in 1996, they applied for a loan and were rejected because their accounts were shocking. So that's a little bit of a backstory, which takes you and I to June 6th, 1996. Secrets have a way of coming back to haunt you. There's a hostage situation right now. This blast was more over on the side of the park, right by so the... Out the, shot. the goalkeeper can't keep it out, and Germany have won it! Already know what they want for Christmas, a new video game system called Nintendo 64. Now Mario lives in a 3D world, and you can make him go wherever you want. Welcome to the rock! Uncovering, like, the truth of what happened in the very early hours of June 6th, 1996, requires one to look at a lot. Uh, which we will, and probably still not uncover the truth. This is like the definition of whodunit. On June 6th, 1996, at 2.31 a.m., 911 dispatchers in Roulette, Texas, received a call from the Routier residence at 5801 Eagle Drive. Uh, 911, what is your emergency? Ma'am? <laughs> Darley Routier, 26 years old at the time, was, you know, reporting that, you know, somebody had broken in and had attacked her and her two sons. Devin and Damon were murdered as they slept on the ground floor of the family home. Devin was stabbed twice in the chest with such force that the knife almost went all the way through his body. Damon was stabbed half a dozen or more times in the back. Darley, who was also sleeping downstairs, had two slice wounds on her right forearm and one on her left shoulder, and her throat had been cut. Eight-month-old Drake and husband Darren were asleep upstairs. The two older boys, you know, since it was summertime, they were sleeping downstairs, and Darley just wanted to watch them. 
And yeah, that's what happened. I mean, we have a, you know, an open window, a slash screen, and then you know, just a very, very terrible scene inside the house. Police say inside that house, seven-year-old Devin and four-year-old Damon Routier were both fatally stabbed in the back around 2.30 this morning. Their mother, 26-year-old Darley, was wounded in the neck and upper shoulder. Now, after she was brutally attacked on the first floor of this house, she had enough strength to call 911. The mother was conscious when we arrived. She said that she did arrived and had fought off the attack. The only description of the attacker was a white male wearing dark clothing. Her husband, Darren, and an infant son were upstairs and not harmed. Authorities spent the day collecting evidence, which will hopefully lead them to whoever was responsible for this brutal attack. Though they have no one in custody, they say they are not ruling out anyone as a suspect. In a written statement given to the police a few days later, Darley told the following story. She was awakened by Damon's cries of, Mommy, Mommy. She saw a long-haired white man wearing a baseball cap and t-shirt and jeans, fleeing through the kitchen and out the utility room. She found the bloody knife on the ground and put it on the counter, and then realized she and her boys had been stabbed. Darren said he heard a noise and then Darley screaming loudly. She was yelling, Devin, Devin, oh my God, Devin. He ran downstairs, went into the living room. He ran over to Devin. The coffee table tipped over on him. Darren slapped his face to get him to say or look at him. No response. So he then started CPR, but air came out of his chest. So he held his hand over the holes on his chest while continuing CPR. That didn't work either, so he blew into one of the holes in his chest. Darley, at the meantime, was on the phone with the police. Darren then ran over to Damon, who was laying on the floor in the hallway between the wall and the side of the couch. He had no pulse. Police arrived within three minutes of the 911 call. They discovered a window screen in the garage that had been cut, which indicated a possible entry point for an intruder. Less than half an hour after they arrived at the house, Authorities began to doubt Darley's version of events, saying it was the overall scene which, primarily, is the lack of evidence in many cases, but the entire scene indicated that there had not been an intruder. They decided that the murders were an inside job, concluding that Darley had uh, staged the scene, including her own injuries. Now, Darley wasn't charged immediately, she was taken to hospital, though her wounds were described as superficial. She was released from the hospital only two and a half days later. A few days after leaving the hospital, she showed the police dark bruises that covered her arms from wrist to elbow. Yet, the doctors who examined her said the bruises were too fresh to have been inflicted on the night of the attacks. More likely, they said, Darley hit her arms with a blunt instrument after she left the hospital. Which is lucky when you think about how brutally her two uh, older sons had been uh, done. You know, like they were brute force. Uh, horrific. Still, the doctors say she survived only because the knife stopped two millimeters short of her corroded artery. It was suggested that her necklace stopped the knife from going any further. You know, this, uh, you know, rinky dink necklace. Don't know if that would uh, stop much. Uh, more like a silly string than a necklace and speaking of silly string a few days later this happened they're up in heaven and they're up there having the biggest birthday party that we could ever imagine the routier family spent friday at the tiny grave the brothers share celebrating what would have been devon's seventh birthday the boy's mother who survived the brutal attack says now her family faces rumors they were somehow involved. We're not going to make an issue out of this because anybody that knows us knows how we were, how we lived. What's your sweetest memory? Your sweetest memory of these boys is what? Hmm, I've got a lot of sweet memories. Well, okay, I could time, talk to you for, for days and days and days. You'd have to come and spend, <laughs> come and move in. But, um... So, that's um, interesting. I mean, we've talked about this a few times before, how people react, can react weirdly, can react very differently after something traumatic like that 
happens happens to them. People, everybody can react differently, and there's no no kind of one way people will react. Um, perfectly innocent people have reacted, you know, without uh, fine after something horrible happens. Um, but the police already suspected her, and after that was broadcast on the news, pretty much everybody else then suspected her too. In the uh, court of public opinion, it's uh, not a great look. Twelve days after Damon and Devon's deaths, they arrested Darley. It was only days after the killing that Rowlett police had suspected there was no intruder who stabbed Devin and Damon to death. Investigator said the crime scene told the real story. The prime suspect quickly became the boy's mother, Darley Routier. Rowlett police arrested and charged her with capital murder, a bold move for such a small police department. We believed in our case from the beginning and felt that the proper arena for the facts to come out was in a court of law and not necessarily through the media. I didn't murder my children. For this community, dealing with the murders of Damon and Devin Brudier in their backyard was shocking enough. Now, finding out their mother, Darley, is suspected of the crime, devastated men. So now we're going to look at the evidence, y'all. Evidence that, well, I mean, circumstantial evidence, but could, could you know, indicate there was no intruder it was some kind of bizarre staged scene, and Darley did, you know, to herself. Again, Sandra Melgar E., which also happened in Texas. Texas getting up there, Florida and Canada. Darley had unusual concern about the fingerprints on a knife. Now, it started with the 911 call. But it didn't just end there. It actually went on for, like, in the days following. She oh, the fingerprints on the knife. Just... I, I touched it. I'm telling you I touched it. You know, she was kind of always on it. The murder weapon was a knife from their own home. So it's a... That's something. One of Darren's tube socks with a small amount of both boys' blood in it was found next to a garbage can in the alley that runs behind the Routier's home. A considerable amount of Darley's DNA was found in the toe of that sock. More than could be deposited from, you know, like a light touch. Both of the boys' blood was also in the sock. But... Darley's DNA was on it, but not her blood. If an intruder had somehow used that sock while stabbing the boys and struggling with Darley, her blood, you know, she'd been stabbed quite a bit, her blood would most likely be on it as well. So, did she use the sock if she is the perpetrator as a glove, and then try and get rid of it? Darley claims the intruder was running through the scene, fleeing into the garage, through the utility room, and then from there, away. He apparently dropped the murder weapon on the floor of the utility room. However, blood evidence doesn't show indication of this to be true, that he was running and dropped it while running. There were numerous round drops of low-velocity blood, which indicated little or no movement when the blood was shed. Like somebody stopped and... like that. Now, if a knife covered in fresh blood is being dropped even from waist height, it's gonna leave two different types of patterns. So it seemed very staged that the knife was there, you know. There was enough blood on the door leading to the garage that it dripped down the door, but no blood on or around the exit window in the garage. So the blood seemed like it was like placed on the door and then just there's no blood after that. You think if there was enough blood that it would drip down, there should also be blood following that? Screen debris, right, was found on a bread knife that was in the kitchen. as it, And it was found that the cutting of the screen in the garage was done from the outside. Which makes no sense. Like, the intruder would somehow have to get into the house a different way, grab the bread knife, then go out of the house, cut their way through the screen door from the outside, and then get in again. And then put it back into the block. What? There was very minor displacement of furniture in the family room, indicative of a clumsy attempt to stage the crime scene. And part of the staging is a broken wine glass. See, the wine rack had a safety mechanism engineered into it to prevent the glasses from accidentally falling out. So, how was there a broken wine glass on the floor? The safety features of the wine rack prevented the glasses from accidentally falling out, and an intruder hooking a single glass with his arm or elbow would be next to impossible. Despite writing in her June 8th statement that there was glass all over the kitchen floor, and much later claiming to have been frantically running towels from the kitchen sink to the family room, she didn't have a single cut on either of her bare feet. Darley's superficial wounds were drastically different 
from her son's deep, penetrating stab wounds. A possible hesitation cut, frequently found accompanying self-inflicted wounds, was at one end of the longer cut. Blood was also washed and wiped away in and around the sink area. There was also no blood of Darley's found on the couch where she was sleeping and supposedly received her injuries. A theory that was introduced at trial was that Darley, you know, at two o'clock in the morning, got a knife, uh, stabbed her sons, then went over, washed the knife, then stabbed herself over the sink, and then, you know, kind of let some blood droplets go around the place, you know? And then she said that she placed towels, uh, on to wet towels on each of her son's backs, two on Devon's and uh, three on Damon's, right? But that's been contradicted by the first responders who said that they arrived two minutes after 911 call was made, there was no towels on anyone's backs. And that when the first officer to get there arrived, he said he saw Darley with a towel to her neck and she was still on the phone. And then when the responding officer told her to put towels on their backs, remember she said she did, but the responding officer said there was none, he asked her to and she just stood there just like dabbing her own wounds and not moving at all. Even though one of the kids was still alive at this point. Again, according to the officer, one was still alive at this point, trying to breathe. He's got his eyes open and he's trying to breathe. Um, I told her that she needed to help him, but she just wouldn't help him. That's a lie. There's no other words to use. That's a lie. In the end, the police collected pretty much every towel in the house and uh, the kid's blood was on none of them. So, the story's not really making sense at this point, like at all, really. And it, frankly, the, just the entire scene, right? An intruder breaks in, kills two children, and then, you know, leaves an adult who can identify him alive, doesn't steal anything, it's bizarre. Expensive jewelry and Darley's purse were in plain sight in the kitchen, and we're still there. I remember this is at two o'clock in the morning, so how did a stranger get through the garage, pitch black, not ruffle up dust, not get blood anywhere, not trip over anything, and then escape through like a tiny little screen window? There was essentially no evidence to support the idea that there was an intruder in the routier house that night. Sorry. Darley was convicted by a Texas jury on the 4th of February 1997 of a stabbing death of her younger son Damon. She was also charged with the death of Devon, but she wasn't tried for it. She was judged to be a uh, spoiled, materialistic person who just callously killed her children. And for what? She was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Throughout, she was supported by her husband Darren, who believes her to be innocent. I just want people to keep an open mind. I want people to know I did not murder my children. I know what happened in that house that night. Now, did she do it? Well, that's a tricky question because many believe she didn't. But if she did, uh, what would cause her to spiral out of control? On May 3rd, 1996, one month before the murders, Darley wrote a suicide letter to her children. I hope that one day you will forgive me for what I am about to do. My life has been such a hard fight for a long time, and I just cannot find the strength to keep fighting anymore. I love you tree more than anything else in this world. I don't want you to see a miserable person every time you look at me. Your dad loves you all very much, and I know in my heart he will take care of my babies. Please do not hate me or think in any way that this is your fault. Barbara Jovel, a close friend of Darley's, testified for the prosecution. She told the jury that Darley was to commit suicide because things were getting to her. Sometimes she felt like everybody expected too much of her, and the children sometimes wanted too much. And she just felt like she wanted to end it all. Darley was nervous and depressed, and she fought with Darren a lot. Barbara Jovel testified that when she arrived at the Routiers the day before the murders, Darley was very upset, pacing back and forth between the kitchen and the family room. The tension was so palpable that Barbara didn't stay long. Again, I mentioned this towards the beginning, but they were in dire straits financially, like not good. So no motive was ever proved. I mean, like what kind of motive could you possibly have for doing what happened? But then again, the prosecution, they didn't have to prove a motive. They just have to prove you did it. Circumstantially prove you did it. I mean, 
Motive is not a fact that must be proven to convict a defendant. The state had the facts required by law, and they proved those facts beyond a reasonable doubt. Did they though? Years later, jurors on the case said they made the wrong decision. At the trial, they were shown the Silly String Graveyard video. They were shown it eight or nine times, in fact. However, what they weren't shown was that the birthday party followed a psalm prayer service and was done as a way to mourn for her children. Had we been shown this other tape so we had been able to see the whole picture of what happened that day, I believe I would not have voted to convict Mrs. Routier, a juror said. The family is upset that prosecutors plan to use against Routier a videotape shot by Texas News 5. It shows Routier joyfully celebrating her son's birthdays only a few days after their deaths. Aiken says it was simply Darley's way of helping the neighborhood kids get over the tragedy. Darley and Darren felt like this is something that, for the emotional support for the children in, in the neighborhood that love these kids that were in and out of their house constantly, a party had to be held so these children could adjust. In 2002, an analysis was conducted by a forensic anthropologist, and it determined that a bloody fingerprint found on a glass table in the room where the murders took place does not as the prosecutors contended, match either of the boys. Nor does it match Darley, Darren, or any of the investigators or emergency workers who were at the house that night. It almost certainly belongs to an unidentified adult, bolstering the defense's theory that someone broke into the house. And also, given the pathologist's estimate that Damon could have survived his wounds for only nine minutes, that the 911 call lasted six minutes, and that police arrived within a minute after the end of the call, that barely left over two minutes for Routier to, quote, stab her sons, head for the garage, step through a slit in the window screen, jump a back fence or go through a back gate, run barefoot for 75 yards down an alley, drop a bloody sock, run 75 yards back, stab herself, clean up the blood around the sink, and stage whatever crime scene there was left to be staged as Texas Monthly puts it. Remember, right, the stab wound that went into her was only two millimeters from her corroded artery. Could have easily killed her. And then, you know, remember, like, brought up a few times the financial shit they were in. Like, there's no financial benefit really to killing the two boys. They had life insurance, but it was like baby life insurance. It was only worth $10,000 when her husband, Darren, was worth $800,000. So if it was for money, why not kill him? The defense also did not present the fact that a man matching the attacker's description was seen 10 minutes from the routier home after 2 a.m. the night of the murders. Several neighbors told the police they had noticed a dark car slowly cruising the area in the weeks before the crime. One even said that the car occasionally stopped near the routier's house. Investigators, however, never believed that Darley and her sons were the victims of a random attack by a stranger, nor were they able to find anyone who had a reason to harm them. On June 11, 1996, Mary Rickles, sometimes called Angel because her middle name is Angela, contacted the Rowlett Police Department to inform them that during the early morning hours of June 6th, D-Day in this case, an unidentified man had tried to get into her home. The defense called Mary to testify at Darley's trial. She explained that she had been home with her 15-year-old daughter when the incident happened. In her testimony, she described seeing two men standing outside through a peephole in the door. One was stockier than the other, wearing a knit cap. He had blonde hair sticking out from under the cap. She said he was wearing a dark jogging suit. The other individual was tall and thin. The men ran from the house and headed in the direction of Willowbrook Drive. Willowbrook eventually leads to Eagle Drive, where the Routiers lived. Let's talk about the bread knife for a second. Remember the one that was found in the house, right? It was in like the block, and it didn't make any sense because it seemed like it had screen debris on it. And if it had screen debris on it, an intruder wouldn't have made sense. As I said, it would have had to get it out some way. Get the bread knife, go outside, cut away in. What? What's that about? Well, yeah. I'm not sure if that was screen debris found on it. 
The fiber that was found on the bread knife was also consistent with the fiberglass brush that had been previously used to dust for fingerprints. So maybe that bread knife wasn't used by anyone at all. Darley's husband Darren was never a suspect, yet Darren admitted he had been considering an insurance scam shortly before the murders. In the spring of 1996, when his business was in trouble and he was $22,000 in debt, Darren had asked Darley's stepfather if he knew anyone who could break into the house and fake a burglary, and said it was a possibility he had brought it up with others as well. However, a private investigator working on Darley's appeal found no evidence he had taken the scam any further. Now, this never came out before the trial. Darren lost Drake's custody because of his support for his wife. Well, ex-wife now. Drake was put under his grandparents' care, and Darren was granted only visitation rights. Darren and Darley divorced in September 2011, citing a mutual need to get out of the limbo they had been in since her arrest and conviction. Darren has since remarried. was laying face up on the carpet with his eyes open and the last thing that young boy saw in his lifetime was his killer his mother coming down at him with a knife and I did not murder my children I love them so it doesn't bother you that you have no eyewitness no motive no sense and no confession she did everything to herself She's put herself on death row because of what she did to those two children. The thing that really drew my attention more than anything were the bloody bare footprints in the kitchen area that had broken glass on top of them. But the glass wasn't bloody, and there was no blood trail from an intruder. Dust undisturbed on that windowsill, a gate that was difficult to open. It's so many inconsistencies that everything she said that occurred that night does not fit anything at the scene. You did apparently say during that interview with the policeman that if I did it, I can't remember. No, I did not. I never said that. Psychopathic person with absolutely no shame, no guilt, no remorse, no human compassion. If I had done this to my children, I would be the first person to stand up and say, oh my God, I need help. What have I done, you know? A mother couldn't live with herself. But now, Darley, they're saying that you could live with it because you're a psychopath and that you could kill and not I'm have a conscience about it. I'm sure that fits it. their theory. Darley still says she's innocent and new DNA tests are being done on some of the items, you know, from the home. Maybe they will find DNA pointing towards somebody else. I mean, or maybe they won't. I mean, there's elements there to question, well, everything. I mean, nothing in this case makes sense at all to me. If it was an intruder, it doesn't make sense. And if it was Darley, there are parts that make me question that too. It's a difficult one. Is this a case of an innocent person behind bars or has justice properly been served? One of the key things was the silly string video that helped convince the jury she was guilty. She showed like she didn't care. She was happy out days after two of her kids were brutally killed. Uh, you know, and that helped convict her. And if that um, influences you as well, just remember the jury voted to convict her a lot of it on that, and they didn't see the whole thing. But who really knows what we're missing in this case and what the entire thing is? Ah. Well, please let me know your thoughts on this case in the usual place. And finally, thank you so, so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. I will see you as always real soon in the next video. Take care of yourselves. Mike out.